Greetings. This is Dr. John Tillman, your college professor uh, for U.S. history since 1877. This lecture here deals with consumerism, black artistry, and Harlem Renaissance. It complements chapter 23, which really deals with the Roaring Twenties. The Roaring Twenties is a very exceptional and a very important time period in American history. Of course, I want to show you um, the African-American experience during the Royal Twenties as well, along with what is consumerism, because that's a major part of it. Here, I want to talk about Black artistry and the Harlem Renaissance. What we're really getting into is the mainstreaming of Black culture. Here are some pictures of Harlem Renaissance. This right here is a picture of Langston Hughes, the famous writer. Here's a picture of Duke Ellington and his famous quartet jazz band. What we're going to be dealing with is black culture expression during the 1920s in both music and in art, and a role it plays in consumerism from 1920 to 1933. Okay, now, one thing I want you to talk about here, what is very important, when you look at the PowerPoints in chapter 23, or if you have your textbook, it don't matter, I mean, either textbook or the PowerPoint, or the document you'll be watching. What you're going to be seeing here is how much America has evolved in technology, the role of media, the role of consumerism. You see these huge ads. You have American people buying radios. They're listening to radios for the first time. They don't have televisions yet, but they have radios. You also have uh, American people who are going to movie theaters they're watching movies, right? This is a radio. You also have people who are buying phonographs and buying music. This is the RAC Victor. You know, I don't even remember the uh, the little dog blowing into the little record player horn. You have these ads for cigarettes, these ads for Coca Cola. These are humongous because they're drawing attention. The whole purpose is consumerism. It's trying to attract consumerism, and it's during a economic time where there's no there's no regulation. It's all about consumerism. It's all about making money. It's all about presenting yourself. And what many people call, quote unquote, loose morals, whatever you want to say, right? The so-called progressive era is over. That's done and done with. And now what you have is the era of consumerism, where it's the era of buying things. And where do black folks fit in? Where do their artistry fit in in terms of American consumerism? Well, we realize that it's very huge. One is jazz music. Now, let's understand something. What we want to say is this, is that when you talk about black culture, black culture has helped to make the South and helped to make American culture, period. Jazz music is the first American art form ever created. There's no other art form America has made except for jazz. And that jazz comes from folks who were once enslaved in this country. So when you look at jazz music, it starts in the South. It starts in New Orleans. It starts in what is Western Mississippi. And it's shaped by different regions and eras due to black migration. Remember we talked about black folks migrating to the north, migrating to Chicago, migrating to Los Angeles, St. Louis. Well, they all began to create these different forms of jazz music. I give you a great example. When you look at, you know, whether it was R&B or hip hop, there is a West Coast version, a Southern version, or a Northern version. Or if you go back to the old R&B, Misfits Blues, uh, 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 Chicago Blues, Detroit Blues, Philadelphia Blues, you know, like Philadelphia Blues, like the OJs and everything, or Detroit Blues, like the, the Spinners, or Stats Records in Memphis. I mean, this that's what I mean by these different forms of jazz music shaping this region. Well, back here in jazz music is Dixieland, it's Big Band, it's Dry, and Afro-Caribbean dance rhythms. Well, now you have people realize, hey, there's a huge commodity being made off of this. So they had to come in. One man, he had something to create because called Race Records. And Race Records was a music industry where they would go out and record blues artists, um, ragtime artists, and jazz artists, black jazz artists, to sell specifically to black people. When black folks are migrant up to the north, they what they realize is that, hey, look, black folks are actually consumers. Well, everyone are consumers. To be an American means to be a consumer, right? So they had to tap into that market. 
One man named is Harry Pace. His person right here, white man. He created something called the Black Swan Records. It's a rest is a race record company that's whose audience is geared specifically for black audience. You begin to see it as well with Chase Records in Chicago and that so on and so on. So we look at jazz music, man, it's something that is the how it's shaped by the Great Migration. This is, becomes part of the consumer culture because it's not just black folks who are buying it, but a younger generation of white of white Americans are also purchasing jazz music. All right. And some of your greatest jazz musicians, of course, is Louis Armstrong, Fletcher Henderson, of course. These are these famous quartet bands that they had during the 1920s. What you're really looking at is, yes, you're going to experience racism as well. At the same time, you're seeing black folks becoming ex acknowledged in the mainstream for in jazz music. Now, it doesn't come all the way. Of course, you had white artists and that was first. But you have that. Here are more race records. This is Ethel Waters, uh, Mammy Smith, Perfect Race Records, the great Southern Color Artist. I mean, you know, you see Ethel Waters, Bessie Smith, Mammy, you know, these are race records. They're selling. These are famous artists. So right here, you begin to see black people in America being acknowledged for their artistry. All right. Now, how are they able to perform? You could not perform, even though they're being acknowledged, they cannot perform in white hotels and white theaters. You had what they would do is you had something called the Chitlin Circuit. And the Chitlin Circuit was a circuit that black artists traveled to. They understood where black folks lived in in urban cities and urban southern cities and rural areas. And you would travel into these particular areas on a certain Chitlin Circuit in New York, Baltimore, Washington, D.C., you will visit the Royal Theater in Baltimore. You will visit the Apollo Theater in New York or the Fox Theater in Detroit or the Regal Theater in Chicago or the Dunbar Theater in Philadelphia. And you will perform in those theaters because those theaters are located in black commercial districts. And that's where they go to play blues, jazz, ragtime, etc. The people who put this thing together were the theater owners booking associations, all right? And these musicians would patronize, they would live in black, they would stay in black hotels, they would stay patronized in black folks' homes where they stayed in. So most black folks knew each other, they knew these artists. They would play in black-owned hotels and taverns, or white-owned hotels and taverns in those black districts. So that was what you call the Chitlin Circuit. Now, also, this tour was very grueling, and it's, very grueling. So the musicians, it was, you know, it was constant. And they weren't always paid as much. But that was the rule of segregation. Right? So you go from the circuit. And of course, here is, you know, you know, Sun House, uh, Robert Johnson, Blind Willie. These are famous country blues. You know, country music is pretty much, you know, blues music. I mean, that's what it was. Blind Willie Mattel. This is 1920s African Americans in Harlem. Of course, you have this 1920s how they dress up. Now, the Harlem Renaissance were created by the six midwives, and we'll show that picture later on. The goal was to use black art as a tool of racial equality and racial advancement. They used sculpture, they used painting, they used literature. One of the biggest four leaders of this was Jessie Fawcett, who was a famous writer. And in her article where it said there was confusion, which talks about race and being black in America and everything else. Well, by 1924, these six midwives will come to create, well, sat down in the Civic Club with the William Harmon Foundation. It's the William Harmon Foundation who are funding what is called the Harlem Renaissance. They fund sculpture, they fund painting, they fund literature. And this is the making of, of course, the Harlem Renaissance. Now, who are the six midwives? Six midwives is right here is Alan Locke. That's Jesse Fawcett. This is Casper Holston, who was from the Caribbean, who who was a numbers runner. Uh, Walter White, this be P to P. Um, Charles Johnson who was the head of the National Urban League, and of course, James Weldon Johnson. These are what you call the six midwives 
of the Harlem Renaissance. These are the folks who sat down with the William Harmon Foundation, and the goal was racial advancement. They saw it as a form of racial advancement. And now you have some of the famous who were famous sculpts and altars, such as Aaron Douglas, who was a preeminent visual artist of the period. And most of it was African influenced aesthetics. Archibald Motley, who gained period for his paintings of the Chicago black working class. You know, Sergeant Johnson, who who created, you know, what you begin to see here is these famous sculptures and how they reminisce of their African ancestry in, the, in their particular sculptures, Archibald Motley itself. And this is some, how some of their paintings and sculptures look like. Now you have those also in literature. You have Jesse Fawcett. She mostly wrote about black professionalism and issue with mixed, mixed race identity. The second person that you see right here is Nella Larson. Nella Larson is very important. This picture of her picture right here. She wrote books such as Quicksand and Passing, which talk about black upper class people passing for white. She never gained the recognition she deserved. She mostly died, died broken. She worked her last years as a midwife and a nursing assistant. And of course, you had Langston Hughes, who was incorporating jazz and rhythm and blues, and he admired black vernacular culture. But his also literature also tackled very politically charged themes, dealing with black issues of race, race, class, living in urban society, etc. There are many people who have come out of the Harlem Renaissance. Many of the people in the Harlem Renaissance were also influenced by black nationalists such as Marcus Garvey, etc. This is James Van Van Dizzy. He's a photographer. This is who he is in his later years. Of course, this is some of his famous photography during the Harlem Renaissance as well. Now, there are clashes here. There are many uh, co controversies dealing with the Harlem Renaissance. Of course, if you remember the documentary we saw about Zora Neale Hurston. Zora Neale Hurston is very important in the Harlem Renaissance. She was using, she used a term called Negrotarians. And she coined the phrase because she's talking about the racial paternalism among wealthy whites. Well, what happened is that when you had the William Harmon Foundation and other white foundations who wanted to fund the Harlem Renaissance, they felt that it was imperative that they would use their money to control what type of art they can do. Right? Then you had this term called respectable art to counter stereotype versus black southern and urban cultural expression. What you had here was folks like Walter White and Alan Locke who felt that the Harlem Renaissance should be to promote a respectable view of the race to counter the racial stereotypes that they had of black people during the time period. And they felt that there needed to be things that were respectable. They looked down on black southern vernacular, black southern culture, etc. Um, they felt that that black southern culture was something of a plantation. Well, for many black Southerners who were involved in the Harlem Renaissance and those who live in urban society, they want to they want to express themselves culturally. They wanted black cultural expression the way they viewed it. Fofa Langston Hughes wanted to express a very urban cultural society, you know, of brothers in the streets, you know, whether they be, you know, some of the rough sides of Harlem, the type of Harlem area that they did not want to engage that they not want to show. Folks like Alan Locke felt that, that the rough sides of Harlem, whether it's prostitution, uh, 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 pimpery, etc., is not a, is not a respectable view for black people. And third but not least, this picture right here is Carl Van Vecken, who um, wrote the book called Nigger Heaven. He's also been accused of cultural appropriation. And this has come up again among those who are engaging in the Harlem Renaissance, we had white artists who were enthusiastic about black black culture, black literature, black art, and felt that they them and felt that they too could participate into the Harlem Renaissance. But this caused a lot of the stir because they felt that okay, you know, his book became first of all they were offended by the book, the word nigger heaven, and also the fact that he can gain prominence in the Harlem Renaissance itself. Um, and the final analysis, this is the final slide. I want to talk about the, the Roaring Twenties and the role that black people played into it, the role of consumerism, and also the mainstreaming of black culture through the Harlem Renaissance. 
I only have about five seconds left on this thinking, so good day. And I answer more questions during the virtual classroom. Thank you.